Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the California Planning Foundation Student Scholarship Awards and Professional Learning Session. I'm Juan Borelli, the president of the California Planning Foundation. Next slide, please, Hillary. Tonight's celebration is in honor of Richard H. Weaver, who was a longtime supporter, board member, and past president of CPF, as well as a distinguished planner in Southern California. Upon his retirement and after he passed a few years ago, Richard and, and his estate made the largest ever endowment donation to CPF. Still to this day, to help us establish CPF Richard, CPF's Richard H. Weaver Scholarship as his lasting legacy in perpetuity to represent his passion for California planning students and the planning profession. And so I want to acknowledge and express a huge thank you to planning giant Richard Weaver. Next slide, please. But well before Richard Weaver's time serving on the board, CPF was created in 1970 by the APA California chapter as its 501c3 nonprofit charitable affiliate, where every member of APA California is also automatically a member of CPF. And the primary focus of CPF is to provide scholarships to California university students in financial need. Scholarship recipients come from many backgrounds and are selected because they are talented, motivated, and have demonstrated academic excellence at California university planning programs, as well as a commitment to increase diversity in the profession and a commitment to serve the profession after graduation, be that in leadership positions in the national, state, and local sections of APA, or in the California communities that they live and will work in as city planners. Since its establishment, CPF has awarded more than $600,000 in scholarships. And this year alone, we have awarded $70,000 in scholarships. But that wasn't always the case. The first fundraising proposal to create a single scholarship prior to CPF's formal establishment was back in 1958. Nine years later, in 1967, the chapter raised enough money to award the very first scholarship of $500. The scholarship was awarded in honor of late, the late Howard G. Bissell, a Stockton architect and former San Joaquin County planning director who initiated the fundraising effort. And the recipient of that scholarship was Frank A. Ducote, who was a first year planning student working on his master's degree uh, in city and regional planning at UC Berkeley. And he went on to become one of the most experienced and influential urban designers in Vancouver and throughout British Columbia. How far we've come from that very first $500 scholarship to grow our CPF student scholarship program into what it is today. Next slide, please. But it truly takes a village, so it's my honor now to introduce to you the small but nimble group of 2020 CPF Board of Directors. They include CPF's Vice President and one of the three scholarship committee members, Heng Wong, CPF Treasurer and 2020 Fundraising Committee member, Lisa Wise, CPF Secretary and also one of the three scholarship committee members, Hillary Nixon, CPF Webmaster, Eric Mum, CPF board member and 2020 fundraising committee member, Aaron Fennensteel, CPF student representative and 2020 fund fundraising committee member, Brian McGinnis, ex officio APA California vice president of professional development, Sharon Gruwall, ex officio APA California university liaison for Southern California and the third scholarship committee member, Merle Rabinowitz Bussell, and last but certainly not least, ex officio APA California University Liaison for Northern California, Rick Cross. Next slide. And we also have appointed CPF section liaisons that serve on each of California's eight section boards. They help us to get the word out about CPF and its scholarship program, and they include Ralph Gachadorian in the central section, Chelsea Richer in the Los Angeles section, Edgar Maravilla in the Northern section, who's also serving as a 2020 fundraising committee member, Dana Privet in the Orange section, also serving as a 2020 fundraising committee member, Dave Schlegel in the Sacramento Valley section, 
and again, Merle Rabinowitz bustle in the San Diego section. Let's give all of these CPF board members and, C and section liaisons a big virtual round of applause for their tireless work and incredible dedication to CPF. You'll note that we do have uh, two liaison vacancies that we are currently recruiting for in the Central Coast section and in the Inland Empire section. So if there's any students, young emerging planners or seasoned professionals that live or work in those sections who are interested in either of those positions, please email me at juan.borelli at sanjoseca.gov or send me a private message via chat during this Zoom event. Next slide. Of course, today's event and the CPF scholarship program would not be possible without the support of our many generous donors and supporters, including first and foremost, the APA California chapter, all eight of the APA California sections and all of our individual corporate, uh, individual and corporate donors, uh, including many attendees at this event tonight who are listed on the donations page of the CPF website at www californiaplanningfoundation.org. Thank you on behalf of all past and current scholarship recipients for your ongoing generous support of the CPF scholarship program. Next slide. Now, unfortunately, um, Oh, actually, um, she's, 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 she's on. Oh, great. Excellent. So Julia has been able to join us. There, there was a little technical glitch and we weren't sure, um, but she is our very special guest and distinguished planner. Uh, Julia Johnston, uh, Lave Johnston is APA California's president. Um, she wanted to say a few inspiring words today, particularly to our student scholarship recipients, but really to everyone at this event tonight. We appreciate your valuable leadership and support, Julia, and we are truly honored to have you join us today. Welcome. Thank you so much, Juan. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. So Luckily, the only technical glitch we've had so far with the conference is my home Wi-Fi. So I'm really grateful for that, a whole day with no other problems. So I really want to thank our great technical team, all our volunteers, um, all of our student and young planner volunteers. They are doing an amazing job. I'm so impressed. We could not be doing this without them. So Juan is correct. Um, students are near and dear to my heart, and I am... That is actually my biggest disappointment in not having an in-person conference because I so enjoy meeting all of the students and young planners, um, getting to know you, hearing about why you wanna be planners and how I love how passionate you are about, about the profession. However, I do realize that having a virtual conference allows more of you to join us and to participate in the conference. So it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. So our future, all of our futures, like the future of APA California and the profession is of course unknown. While all of us will play a role in shaping that future, it will be you, uh, those of you who are just starting your careers, that will actually be the future. We are truly living in a state of change. Many of you have heard older planners scarred from recession downsizing, sleep deprived from too many late night meetings, eyes dim from reading CEQA comments, say that as a planner, you need to be resilient and adaptable. But the challenges that we are facing today are new to all of us. This extraordinary moment gives us an opportunity to rethink our profession and how we practice it. During this conference, you will hear a lot of talk about the dark, the dark time of planning, um, when our profession played a role in supporting systemic racism. Well, we still have a lot of work to do, and we need your help. It will seem like a blink of an eye, and then one of you out there will be standing where I am right now. What will you be saying? Will you be able to report that APA California met the challenge of equity and diversity and rooted out systemic racism? That we took the necessary risks and cared more for the people we plan for than the status quo? Those of us who have dedicated ourselves to this profession truly hope so. Help APA California actualize the profession so that it reflects our shared values and goals of equity, diversity, and sustainability. Now, more than ever, you have the opportunity to be the change. Be bold, plan to lead, I have your back. I look forward to talking with more of you of time over time. Please, please reach out to me. I am more than happy to talk to any of you about the profession, and I hope to see you, many of you, up here on this panel in the future. Thank you so much. 
I'm going to log off and try to fix my Wi-Fi for tomorrow, but I hope to see you all in the chats tomorrow. Please come up and say hello to me. And congratulations, so congratulations on your scholarships. I know that you truly are our future. So thank you very much. Bye everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Juan, your, um, <laughs> your mute is on, so. Oh, thank you, so sorry. Thanks again, Julia, for sharing such passionate and empowering words um, with all of our future leaders. Now let me turn the screen over to our CPS Scholarship Committee members, Ing, Hillary, and Merle, who are, uh, have the pleasure of announcing and celebrating our 2020 CPF Scholarship recipient. Oh, just text me, that was very nice. Okay, so uh, we'll stay on this. We'll, Hillary, stay on that page. <laughs> just, that uh, I think someone's in the yeah. background somewhere. There we go. Um, so these are uh, the 2020-2021 scholarship recipients. Uh, it's the largest number that we've ever had. Um, if you look through our, or you scroll through your Zoom uh, page right now, you'll see many of these uh, online. So please congratulate them at the end of the program. Next slide, Hillary. As Juan mentioned, uh, we've uh, given more scholarship this year to more students and uh, had more scholarship award uh, than ever, ever before. In fact, uh, 75 applic uh, applicants uh, were turned in and that's uh, about 50% more than any other previous years. Uh, we awarded 45 scholarships to 44 deserving students out of that, most, uh, the majority of them were graduate students. Uh, there were also 10 undergrad students. And we also awarded to more colleges and uh, university programs than ever before, 14 this year. So um, congratulations to all the scholarship winners. At this point, uh, I'd like to start with the presentation. Um, I'll do the first 15 uh, scholarship recipient and then I'll hand it over. Next. Our CPF Outstanding First Place Scholarship goes to Cuesta Gleason from Cal Poly Pomona. Cuesta will also be serving as the CPF uh, student rep for the next uh, year. There are three CPF Outstanding Runner-Up Scholarships. The, one of them goes to Kevin Dumler from UC Berkeley. Another one goes to Whitney Heller from Cal State University, Northridge. And the third CPF Outstanding Runners Up Scholarship goes to Carline Hua from UC Irvine. The CPF Diversity and Planning Scholarship goes to Laura Elaine Daza Garcia from UCLA. There are three CPF Merit Scholarships one of them goes to Jasmine Amini from UC Berkeley. Another goes to Felicia Jang from UC Berkeley. And the third one goes to Natalie Tran from UC San Diego. The Richard H. Weaver Scholarship goes to Alejandro Gonzalez from UCLA. There are three California Planning Roundtable Memorial Scholarship. The first CPR scholarship goes to Jerilyn Jackow from UCLA. Another one goes to Emmanuel Lopez from UC Berkeley. And the third one goes to Maribel Sandoval Contreras from Cal State North University Northridge. The APA California Scholarship honoring Frank Ween goes to Dory Ganesso from UC Berkeley. The David Wilcott Scholarship goes to Matt Phillips from UCLA. And the Ken Milam Scholarship goes to Reagan Murphy from USC. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Hillary who will give out the next uh, 15 recipients. Thanks, Ting. Receiving the Paul Wack Cal Poly San Luis Obispo Scholarship is Josephine Buchanan from Cal Poly Slo. 
Congratulations, Josephine. Receiving the Paul Wack Sustainability Scholarship is Irene Takago Farr from UCLA. Congratulations, Irene. Receiving the Planners for Health Scholarship is Honora Montano from UC Berkeley. Congratulations. Receiving the Ted Holtham Memorial Scholarship is Rashid Shabazz from UC Berkeley. Congratulations, Rashid. Receiving the Virginia Viado Memorial Scholarship is Christian DeCastro from UCLA. Congratulations, Christian. Receiving the Russell Fay Central Section Scholarship is Antonio Olea from CSU Fresno. Congratulations, Antonio. Receiving the Central Coast Section Scholarship is Josephine Buchanan from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And receiving the second Central Coast Section Scholarship is Wesley Wong, also from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Receiving the Inland Empire Section Scholarship is Norma Flores from Cal Poly Pomona. Receiving the second Inland Empire Second Scholarship is Dominique Gonzalez, also from Cal Poly Pomona. We have several LA Section Scholarships. The first goes to Sabrina Alonzo from University of Southern California. Congratulations, Sabrina. Another LA Section Scholarship goes to Brian DeLerie from Cal Poly Pomona. Congratulations, Brian. Another LA Section Scholarship goes to Danielle Dirksen, University of Southern California. Another LA Section Scholarship goes to Serena Lynn from USC. Congratulations, Serena. And another LA Section Scholarship goes to Daniel Liu from UCLA. Congratulations, Daniel. Moving on, I'm going to turn the, the uh, presentations over to Merle to continue with the next 15 awards. Okay, terrific. And continuing with our Los Angeles Section Scholarship recipients, we have Edgar Mejia from UCLA. Also receiving a Los Angeles Section Scholarship is Roxanne Rivas from Cal State University Northridge. Receiving another Los Angeles Section Scholarship is Lena Rogal from UCLA. Receiving a Los Angeles Section Scholarship is Nathan Romine from CSU Northridge. Receiving another one of our Los Angeles Section Scholarships is Matthew Vu from LA Trade Technical College. We have several Northern Section Scholarships. Our first recipient is Hesie Choi from San Jose State University. Another Northern Section Scholarship recipient is Ethan Ebinger from UC Berkeley. Also receiving a Northern Section Scholarship is Hannah Meeks from Sonoma State University. Receiving a Northern Section Scholarship is Carl Reinhardt from UC Berkeley. Receiving a Northern Section Scholarship as well is Rafael Velasquez from UC Berkeley. We have a few Orange Section Scholarships. Our first recipient is John Maldonado from UC Irvine. Also receiving an Orange Section Scholarship is Veronica Morones from UC Irvine. Receiving a Sacramento Valley Section Legacy Scholarship is Evangelina Chavez from Sacramento State University. And then we have two San Diego Section Scholarship recipients, Samantha Diaz from UC San Diego. And last but not least, our final recipient this year, also receiving a San Diego Section Scholarship, is Samuel Solis from San Diego State University. And a hearty congratulations again to all of our recipients. And with that, I will turn it over to Juan. Thank you, Hing. Hillary and Merrill, and a big congratulations again to all of this year's very deserving student scholarship recipients. 
you know, something new that we did this year um, is we've listed all of uh, these scholarship recipients on the CPF scholarship page of the website, and their, their names are actually live links to their LinkedIn pages. So if you're looking to hire interns or uh, planners um, starting their careers um, once they graduate, um, please uh, don't hesitate to go to our website um, since they truly represent academic excellence um, right now in their scholastic studies. So as many of you know, CPF's past signature annual fundraisers are raffles and an on live, uh, I'm sorry, and an online <laughs> or live and silent auctions that are held at our uh, in-person chapter conferences. These fundraisers help to raise the money each year to award the following year's major CPF scholarship ships. Uh, because uh, this year's conference has gone completely virtual and adopted the conference theme of state of change, we too are changing it up and trying some, uh, something different, a different fundraising approach. So in lieu, of, in lieu of an auction or raffle fundraiser during the conference, starting today and through the rest of this year, we are kicking off a donation outreach campaign to all of our California chapter members. In fact, all of our non-scholarship recipients at this conference and tonight's event can help us by donating online right now at the, uh, at the www.californiaplanningfoundation.org forward slash support CPF um, to help fund one of three different types of uh, our scholarships. The first is a new Stanley R. Hoffman scholarship, which will honor in perpetuity when that scholarship endowment goal is reached, a past uh, CPF president and distinguished Southern California planner who passed away unexpectedly last year. The second is we are trying to fund a second CPF diversity scholarship um, when that scholarship endowment goal is reached, um, we will be able to uh, start having that new scholarship to um, increase diversity or help increase diversity in the profession. And the third category is um, to donate to uh, the general scholarship fund uh, to fund any of next year's major CPF scholarships. You can help bridge the student financial gap and bring diversity to the profession by supporting the CPF student scholarship program. Our goal, our goal for this fundraising campaign is to raise $20,000 in 2020. Uh, the thermometer shown on this slide will soon be posted and updated um, regularly on our website as you and others donate to CPF. It will help to illustrate online our fundraising progress as we work towards achieving our 20K goal in 2020. Again, not today's scholarship recipients, but speaking to all others, uh, on this event, please consider making a donation online now to the CPF Student Scholarship Fund, and together we can continue to support our students who are the future leaders in APA and in the planning profession. There is truly no donation too small or too large. <laughs> Next slide, please. And now to kick off the professional learning session portion of this event, I'd like to turn the screen over to CPF Treasurer and Panel Moderator Lisa Wise. Thank you, Juan. Congratulations to everybody again. Um, job well done. You are obviously or definitely the best of the best um, out there. So let me uh, I'll pull up my screen and we jump into this next section. Can you guys see the screen okay? Okay, very good. Hello everybody, I'm Lisa Wise of Lisa Wise Consulting. It's great to be here. Um, planner and founder of Lisa Wise Consulting for 15 years. Um, also on the CPF board and uh, adjunct faculty at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. With me tonight are two of my uh, longtime colleagues um, and both leaders in the field of planning. We have Patrick Seidman from Seidman and Associates and Tony Perez from Opticos Design. Um, I just want to introduce these folks and then they'll be up in a minute, but Patrick really has a long career in sustainability and transportation planning. Founder of his own firm, prior to this he was with Nelson Nygaard as a principal for a number of years, um, and really on the forefront of innovation, um, sustainability, transportation, and parking, which as we know drives a lot of our 
our urban designs. And I think Pat Patrick is also a river guide and ski instructor um, on the side. Uh, also, Tony Perez is, is um, on the panel. Tony has over 30 years of experience in the public and private sector, national leader in form-based codes, um, working with large and small jurisdictions across the United States. I know he's really passionate about what he does and I've worked with Tony for a long time. Um, Tony is also uh, taking opera lessons at home during the pandemic um, and a huge fan of the current Tour de France. The next slide shows the, um, just let me see, uh, just the agenda for the next the next um, 30 or 40 minutes. We want to talk a little bit about the objectives or what we hope that you get out of the out of the session. Uh, I'm going to kick the, the panel off with reflecting on a couple of past projects we've, that we've done as a team, Tony and Patrick and myself, and then turn it over to Patrick and Tony for their presentations and hopefully we have plenty of, of time at the end for discussion and questions. So in terms of the objectives, what we really want to um, talk about is, you know, what we've learned that might be helpful to, um, to the students on the line uh, and people just joining their careers. We've really geared this towards the students because we thought the, the main audience was the students. So we're looking at um, what's helpful for you as you move into the, to your next, uh, to your final year of school and then the next phase after that. Um, we also have a little bit of helpful career advice in terms of uh, looking at your job search and potential coursework in the coming year. But then more importantly, we have a little bit of information on um, affecting change and thinking about the big picture. It's, uh, as Julia said, it's really a good time to be thinking about that. There's a lot going on. Of course, we're dealing with the pandemic. There's Black Lives Matter. There's climate change. There's just a lot of things coming together right now. Um, and thinking how we impact uh, that and make meaning and lasting change is one of the things we want to cover. And of course, hopefully we have a little bit of fun. We'll see, we'll see how this goes. So jumping into the next couple of slides, these are a couple of projects that Tony and Patrick and I, I worked on uh, together. One is the Ventura Downtown Specific Plan. I think we started that in 2003 or 2004 and it was adopted in 07. And then 10 years later, we did the Downtown Plan for Hayward. So these kind of set the stage in terms of um, what we were doing 15 or 20 years ago and what we're doing now and sort of how our thinking has evolved um, in the planning world and with downtown planning and planning around transit in particular. The downtown venture plan again was um, adopted in 2007 and like a lot of cities, um, their downtown plan and downtown regulations uh, was a broken system. It really didn't work. When you put all the pieces together, you really couldn't get uh, uh, you couldn't build a small infill lot. There wasn't, it wasn't physically um, uh, doable. The, there was height re regulations, there was on-site parking requirements, there was landscaping. So when you put all this together, um, nothing could work. So working with Patrick on the parking regulations, reducing parking requirements and fixing on-street parking requirements, um, we fixed some of that. And then working with Tony on the development regulations and the form-based code, we unraveled that. And the project on the left, is something that got built under the, under the code on California Street. And the project on the right is a affordable housing project for um, artists, for living and working. It was a big priority for the plan. Um, and Tony was instrumental in changing the regulations to let these, let these come online. And then downtown Hayward, which was um, adopted last year. Um, it's on a BART line, as many in the Bay Area know, but there's a lot of challenges um, in downtown Hayward, and one of them is a highway that goes through the downtown. So Patrick was part of the team that helped unravel this uh, mobility issue and really um, uh, come up with strategies to um, undo that one-way highway loop. So with multimodal, uh, multimodal um, strategies, road diets, and of course parking, um, because we're, as we all know, we're still wrestling with parking and it drives a, a lot of the conversation. And then another goal here too was updating the code, although we um, learned a lot over the intervening years of, of what codes and standards need to look like. Um, and Tony was instrumental in getting us a code that really fit and was right for their context um, and for the existing conditions. So then just thinking about uh, a little bit about what we, 
what we learned and sort of what some of the important takeaways from all this work and um, the evolving industry over the last 20, 20 or 30 years. So if I knew then what I know now, a couple of topics that came to mind that might be important or interesting, um, in particular for the students, is the idea of technology. Um, 20 years ago, we all talked about technology. We knew it was gonna move really quickly, but I don't think we knew how fast it was gonna kind of blow our mind. Um, so this is, um, this is something that's, that's changed and evolved, right? From the internet to social media um, and how we actually harness this technology for planning moving forward. One of the key areas that's been um, really impactful um, was mobility and parking. As I said, in, in Ventura, we worked on transit, reducing the number of parking spaces, uh, fixing on-street parking requirements. But in Hayward, we did all that and we looked at autonomous vehicles. We looked at BRT and we looked at more advanced systems for managing parking like smart meters and license plate recognition. Um, so those are evolving uh, in a relatively short period of time. And just a few years later, in terms of technology, we're working on a project in Saudi Arabia um, where some of the technology doesn't exist yet. Um, they're, 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 they're building and planning cities with no, no cars. Nobody will own a private vehicle. 100% um, renewable energy. Uh, more sophisticated food production, sy production systems to um, uh, produce more food with less space and less waste. Um, so in a short, fairly short period of time, um, technologies really entered the arena uh, and changed the way we do a lot of our work. Um, kind of in a similar vein, I wanted to talk a little bit about financing and city budgets. Um, we've always thought about financing and of course developers have always thought about financing. But I think in the planning world, we're a little, we're more in tune to that, into that now. Um, how, how projects get financed um, and what does that look like? When we did the Hayward project, we actually ran pro formas as we're developing the plan and code. So do these projects work or not work and what's the limiting factor? Um, and how does that play into the ending, the ending result for the plan uh, and delivering the code? And of course, uh, city budgets are always important, but becoming more acutely important now, especially with the pandemic. First we had the recession, now we have the pandemic. So what we considered city budgets, now it's almost always required that we do a fiscal impact analysis. We understand the impacts of the program on any, any particular project. Um, and the third item I wanted to talk a little bit about is diversity. I think as planners, we've always been uh, concerned about diversity. But this is an area we're always learning um, and we can always be better. So um, in the beginning, in our earlier work, um, we were focused on diversity and we were focused on going out to the community, not having them come to us. But we're developing more complex tactical really um, efforts when it comes to diversity uh, and solving some of the problems. Um, things like power sharing, capacity building, um, things that are, these are things that we're doing in Long Beach and things that I have I think a long, more long lasting impact um, on our profession. And then the last thing I just want to talk about before I, I pass it over to Patrick is this, um, especially for the students um, and the people maybe going out uh, into a career soon is just the importance of relationships. Really building that professional network um, can't be understated how important that is, uh, really to you personally, but to actually um, creating better results. All of, our, all of our projects and all of our work, it's, are richer um, and more successful because of the relationships we've built and the teams we bring together um, to kind of tackle some of these some of these tough challenges. So maybe it goes without saying, but I think it is important to keep to keep that in mind um, as you move forward into your into your career. And um, my friend Patrick Sigmund is is up next, and I'm going to stop sharing Patrick so um, we don't have this background as a to deal with. All righty. There you go. Well, thank, thank you, Lisa. Can everybody hear me? Great. So, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's, it's an honor to be here. Um, and uh, one thing that I have learned the hard way is, is that um, apparently people retain knowledge better um, when they're either doing something active that forces them to learn it or else participating in a conversation or at least watching one. So I, I'm going to be very brief in my remarks and avoid lecturing, even though I like the sound of my own voice. Um, 
so I'll, I'll briefly say a few things. And I thought it might be helpful if I shared with you a little bit about how I got started as a planner. Um, I'm, I'm probably one of the few people on this call who has no pr planning degree um, and isn't likely to get one anytime soon. Um, and actually, I think that is one of the real strengths of the planning profession is that it is not completely closed off um, to people who come from different professions. So the way I got into this was um, that, well, first of all, I tried out many different careers when I was too restless to sit in a classroom. So I was a ski instructor and river guide, and I, I am actually licensed or was licensed in both of those things. Um, the um, thing is, though, eventually I realized I, I needed to go back to school and do something more important than help people go on vacation. Um, I, I came back home. I, I enrolled at Stanford. I, I thought when I came back that I would be going into international development. And then after a while and some internships, I realized that I really had no business trying to go to somebody else's country and tell them how to do things. And, and I really ought to learn how to do something useful at home in a culture I understood. So I also needed to write a paper for a class on environmental economics. And I, I looked around and there was a story in the Stanford Daily that said there was a new parking garage on campus and it was large and remarkably ugly. Um, and it also, the numbers in the paper, it worked out to $18,000 per parking space um for every space built and this was this was 1992 so i thought well i can get a permit to park in it for only six dollars a month so i don't really understand mortgages or economics yet but uh, somehow the numbers don't seem to be working so i thought i want to find out who paid for this really and not only that but what is it what is the full cost really and and who's paying for this like, where's the money coming from? Because this was a recession. We were in a budget crutch, believe it or not, at Stanford. The, there, there actually was a serious problem. We, we were trying to recover from the Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, so I, I thought, okay, I've got my economics paper topic. I, I went down to the transportation department and I sat down with Julia Friedman, who was the, the leader of the department. Um, and she was kind enough to, listen to me and she said, well, okay, so you wanna find out what a parking garage costs and who pays for it. And, and I've been wanting to know that too. So she gave me a long list of people to interview. I went around, I interviewed them. I went to the library and down in the stacks, I tried to find anybody who'd written anything about the economics of parking. And I discovered all the writing of Donald Shoup, the UCLA professor who knows more than anyone alive about about parking. And he made me realize that this was a great planning disaster and a really important topic and needed reform. Um, and eventually, to cut a long story short, I became an economics major. I wrote my undergraduate honors thesis on why it would be cheaper for Stanford to pay people to leave their cars at home instead of building more garages. Um, and I, I gave that paper to everyone well, a shortened version of it, to everyone who had given me an interview, everybody who I knew on staff. Um, and it turned out that the, the really good news was that we were coming out of a recession, jobs were scarce, it was hard to find um, work. And the, the thing was that I had written something that actually connected to a real problem they were experiencing because the current financial system for parking at the university was broken. And so basically, they were able to give me a job to try to implement some of the things in the paper, um, even though the university was in a hiring freeze. And I, I took a couple things away from that. One is that if you can find a way to meet real people working in the profession you want to be in or just people who have a job that you would like to have someday you think um, and find out the the real problems they're struggling with um, and then try to have your academic studies address that problem um, you you have a much better chance first of all of, of being motivated or at least for me i was much more motivated to to actually do my work because i knew i was working on something real 
Um, it turned out that what I was doing was useful. And also, I think a lot of these folks figured, well, if, if this kid is willing to do this um, instead of studying anything else, then probably he'll work hard if, if we give him a job. And so that got me in the door. At, and I mean, 20 years later, I'm still reading Donald Shoup's work and then repeating it to clients. And that turns out to be a pretty good way to earn a decent middle-class living. Um, so those are some lessons I would take away. Um, it, it, an, another thing is it can be really useful if you take the lessons you learn in one field and bring them to a different field. Um, it, you know, in traffic engineering, it's actually kind of a revelation to hear someone say that if the price of parking goes up, demand for parking goes down. And so do motor vehicle trips. That's like not, that's not something you learn in engineering classes. Um, so the, the fact is I've lost and forgotten most of my advanced economic skills, but, but the basics I remember and, and really learn. So that, that approach of both finding a real problem that somebody is trying to solve and working on it yourself and, and also taking skills from one field and bringing to another, those can both be really helpful. Um, and with that, let me turn it over to Tony. Um, I, I haven't uh, yet admitted all my failures, but feel free to ask me about those and I look forward to our conversation. Um, good afternoon. Um, hello everybody, I'm Tony Perez. And uh, yeah, I didn't know we were gonna do failures uh, today, but uh, I'm happy to share them as, as, they're, as it is effective for you all. Uh, you know, I'll do the same thing as Patrick. I'll give you a couple of um, just overarching uh, topics, uh, and then you know you all can can uh, ask questions. But I think the first thing I want to impart on you all is 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 just that uh, that I learned um, early on. I, I went to Cal Poly Pomona, so it's really great to see all the Cal Poly Pomona um, graduates that earned the scholarships tonight. Uh, that was really awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking right at Questa with the way that my thing is lined up. So congratulations to you and everyone else. But I, I think that, um, uh, you know, very early on in our in our um, education, the instructors, told, you know, made it clear that we would be sorry. I got a lot of sunlight. I'm sorry. I've got the good problem of too much natural light in my office. Um, but they, they let us know very early on that we would be making a lot of presentations, standing in front of people, helping them, facilitating meetings, all kinds of things like that. You know, nothing like that I'd been prepared to do. And through through that education, um, they helped us gain those skills. And then, you know, once you went right into a city, my, one of my first jobs was right, right out of Cal Poly was right into a city. And so you just started developing those skills. Um, for better or for worse, <laughs> and a lot of a lot of advancements and a lot of retreats. But anyway, I I realized quickly, wow, you know, if you're in the public sector, uh, like I was, you're you're you have a responsibility to explain things to people and to explain them consistently and helpfully and with energy, and um, and you know, with, I guess um, giving people some type of um, of uh, way forward instead of sounding like excuses, but you know, really explaining things and helping people understand, and then letting them walk away with what how they want to feel about it. Uh, and so I thought, wow, I, I had no idea this profession that I got into was so much um, imparting or education or however you want to look at the word or equipping. And I guess you know that that's one of the big things I would impart on you today is that um, that has actually become the biggest part of my work. I, I have a lot of technical skills that I've learned along the way, and I've worked with a lot of great people and like Lisa and Patrick, and learned a lot from them as well. But the most consistent thing about being a planner for me is, is learning new ways to keep, help keep people learning and help people understand and help people communicate and explain their point of view. 
Um, not to say that, that I don't have a point of view. I think that's very important when you're talking with people to have a position uh, to not just be, well, I don't know, I don't care. Uh, I, I've talked to people like that and, and my personal experience is that it's not as helpful because they, they, they're too helpful in, in, in saying, well, here's all the information, see you later. But wait, you're, you're a professional. What do you think about it as a professional? So I encourage you to, as a professional, to go ahead and have an, a position. That's okay. What you do with that is, is, is how you have to be careful. Having a position and, a, and understanding where you're coming from and how you feel about something is not wrong. And I think, I think I've experienced uh, professionals saying, well, I can't, a lot of planners, I can't take a position because, uh, you know, I'm not supposed to. There are times when to do that, but there are a lot of times when you should. Um, so anyway, I, I give you that. The other thing is, um, I came into it like like Patrick. I um, except I I went back. I I was going to be an architect, and um, I was going to go to Cal Poly for architecture. And then at the last minute, I said, "No, that's too. It's too focused. I want to broaden out and do more than one building." Um, and so I'm going to study planning. I'm going to go into this urban planning thing. And, um, and so what I did instead is I married an architect. All my friends are architects. Most of my colleagues are architects. I work with architects. So I covered that. <laughs> I covered that need there. But I became a planner and, and I really had, um, at the time, back in 82, uh, I really didn't have an idea of, of what the profession was. So. Um, it, it was it was uh, it was really something, and I, I guess the thing I want to impart on you on about that is that as you enter this profession, I always tell students that I work with, you know, make sure what you're getting into is more more closely aligned with what you think you're wanting to do rather than diametrically opposite. And that sounds obvious, but there are a lot of planners that I meet that say, "Wow, I didn't know that what I was getting into was this." Uh, for example, in my first job, as much as Cal Poly had exposed us and trained us, uh, one of my first jobs was to implement the zoning ordinance at the planning counter. <laughs> I, you know, it's like, okay, we we studied pieces of a code, and I, you know, we weren't exposed enough to really know how to operate it. And and so somebody asks you a question, and you know, here's a person with a property; they're about to make an investment or trying to make an investment, either at their house or a business or an industry, right? And the question comes to you and they say, well, why is it that number and not this number? You told me 10, why is it, why is it 10, not seven or six or four? You know, and, and after a couple of years of that, you start seeing, wow, yeah, they, they have really good questions and I don't have answers for that. So uh, I, yeah, I was not prepared for, for that. Um, so be aware of what you're getting into and, um, and uh, make sure that it's where you want to go. The last thing I'll tell you before we turn it back and get into questions, because um, we could all talk for the whole time by ourselves and that's not what we want to do. The last thing is when you work with people, when you work with communities, neighborhoods, business groups, you know, you're ultimately, um, depending on where you come from, you might have a, a very utilities perspective, you might have a transportation perspective, you might have a demography perspective, um, or you might have a very physical perspective, like I do. I, I come at it from a very physical point of view. And what I've resolved is that all of those perspectives, economic, fiscal, they all resolve into a physical um, world. Like you, you can say, well, you know, there's the economics, there's this, there's the political. Yeah, but at the end of the day, what do we all walk around in? What do we all walk on? What do we, we're, we're all sitting in buildings and we're all sitting in some context, right? And those contexts are different. At the end of the day, you are in a physically oriented profession and how you deal with that and what aspect of that, that that's the beauty of it. It's, 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 very, it's very diverse in that way, but at its core, it's a physical oriented profession. And why do I say that? Why do I take time to explain that? Because it wasn't that obvious to me. And I'm a very physically oriented person. And it wasn't that obvious to me. It was so abstracted in terms of numbers and um, equations and, and, and all these other things. It, it took me a while to really 
understand that. So after, I don't know, 30 years, I, I still feel that way. But um, And if you didn't know that you're going into some kind of physically oriented profession, uh, I just want to uh, let you know now. <laughs> so uh, Lisa, back to you uh, for discussion. Great, thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, we have a couple a couple of um, comments coming in or questions, so I can um, I can moderate a one, and then um, uh, if you need to chime in, that's fine. So, Patrick and Tony, um, one of the first questions is, um, what has been the hardest planning concept to explain to the public? All right, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I, I'll say that one one thing that's often hard to explain, and, and that actually a lot of times we may have trouble determining ourselves, is what can you require um, to be done on a property, or or what can you require of somebody who's proposing a project before you reach that point where it no longer makes any sense for the person to to do anything or build anything on that property and nothing happens. Um, so for example, we, we had a classic uh, argument here in San Francisco over the last several years about what to do with a reservoir that's owned by the city. Um, and one of the key questions was, well, we really need affordable housing. We need below market rate housing. Um, the city does not have enough funding um, and none in prospect to simply build public housing on that on that site. Um, so the only way to get it done is to allow some private investment to come in and build some market rate housing um, and have that plus the value of the public land result in a lot of, of uh, below market rate housing. Well, one of the questions to figure out is, well, how much of subsidy can we require and, and not only that, but how much else can we require before the project makes absolutely no sense and nothing happens? Um, and as one supervisor here put it, you know, I'm in favor of this project with 50% affordable housing because 60% of zero is zero and 50% of a thousand is 500 homes. And, and that's something worth doing. Um, this argument will come up over and over again. Um, and one thing that, that I know as an economist is it's really useful to either have the skills or else have somebody on your team who has the skills to help figure out the answer to that question. Um, it Of course, it'll change over time. Um, but for example, there's a guy named Ian Carlton and what he does in his profession is he's automated the, the, the task of figuring out when you put regulations onto a plan area, which of those sites within the plan area, which of those parcels would actually be feasible to build something on. Um, so that's a, that's a planning concept that I think is difficult to explain, but crucial to explain and crucial to learn about. Tony, did you wanna chime in? I have something I could add, which I think is similar to Patrick's comment really, is that um, I think one of the things that's really hard to explain, and if anybody has any brilliant ideas of everybody on the phone, we'd love to hear input, is just the, um, just the idea of change, that change can be good. Um, that, you know, not all change is good, but change can be good. And there's no, there's no, there's no really steady state. You know, things are always changing in one way or the other. Um, but in California and really across the country, people are, people are, to a large extent, if not afraid of change, just hesitant to change because they can't see the, they can't see what, what might come, the good that might come out of it. And a lot of this, I think, is caught up in our, um, the way all of our, a lot of our wealth is tied up in our homes and our home values. Um, and anything that's going to impact that, people get pretty concerned about, and, and rightfully so, to some extent. But it's just this idea of, of change and, and the fact that change might be beneficial um, is difficult, and it, or it has been difficult, and I don't see that changing um, anytime, anytime soon. I don't know, Tony, if you wanted to comment on that. Zoning is always a hard concept to get crossed, but... <laughs> 
gets down in the weeds. Um, we have another question, uh, which is a little bit maybe more difficult. What is a specific anecdote or story from your lifetime in which somebody said something to you that stuck and that impacted the way in which you carry yourself uh, throughout your work? So something that happened that stuck and sort of made you made you change your opinion or uh, react differently, I guess. I th yeah, I'll take a stab at that one first. Uh, yeah, I think it relates back to what I was saying at one of my first city jobs um, when I was at the public counter and having to explain what seemed to me and to the property owner is some type of arbitrary or abstract limit on how they could use their property. And it, it wasn't arbitrary or abstract, but without any background, it seemed that way to me. And so uh, I, when I, and the, just that wasn't the only occurrence, but every time that happened until I really started understanding what those numbers meant and why they were set the way they were, I could, I, I empathized with the person I was talking to and telling them, wow, all this effort that you just spent to propose a room addition, something small like that, or to propose a new building. You know, very, very humble project, you know, with very cash strap kind of applicants um, and uh, and having to look them in the, in the eye and say, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do, but these ordinances are the way they are. And there's a process to change that ordinance. But, you know, that it wasn't it wasn't something that they were willing to take on. Uh, and I could just see that in their face over and over and over for several years. And uh, it really bugged at me to, to say, okay, I need to get involved to A, understand where these numbers are coming from and B, um, adjust them if, if necessary. Uh, so it, that, that experience really stuck with me. Patrick. Yeah. So I, I met a guy named Dan Burden about 25 years ago. He, he travels the country with it, it used to be he traveled the country with a gigantic suitcase full of um, carousels of slides, hundreds and hundreds of slides, and would show people how to b make walkable communities and bicycle friendly communities at a time when that was much more of a fringe concept among transportation engineers and planners. Um, and, and Dan, I loved what he did. and, and he turned to me one day and he said, Patrick, I tell stories with pictures. And that really stuck with me. And I've tried to do that ever since. And I learned, I studied and watched what he did and what all the best presenters I, I knew in, in planning and urban design do. And learning to tell stories with pictures is a really critical way of communicating. They're, they're, um, Robert Schiller is the Nobel Prize winning economist um, who studies stock markets and and crashes and panics, um, and he 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 refers to humans as um, homo narrative because we learn through stories, and we also learn through images. And so, if you can both get your points across by telling a story and by sharing powerful images, that is really helpful. Patrick, I I did that um, I did that early on in my career. If anybody. If anybody is here that actually came and saw me as a planner at the public counter early in my career, they would say that's that's totally right on. I I used to take pictures on our vacations and then put them in a photo album and have them underneath the counter. And I would, you know, talk to staff and I'd say, <laughs> hey, you know, when somebody comes in and talks about X, hey, this is the kind of thing maybe we should go for. And you know, that was before guidelines got really very robust and 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 helpful and 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 you know all that. Uh, so I would literally pull a couple of photo albums out and just say, you know, because they'd say, well, what are you looking for? What are you talking about? And I'd say, like this, and you go through pictures. And so, yeah, I, I totally hear you on that. Yeah. Good. We actually have a few more, few more questions. I don't know if you guys are seeing the chat, but um, the next question mm -hmm. I think is, have you seen planning as a profession change over your career? Positive and negative. So I'm, I'm thinking the answer is yes. Um, but then the second part of the question is, and do you think there will be larger shifts for this upcoming generation of planners than we've seen in the past? So how has a profession changed in the past? Um, and how is that going to compare to, or to the future um, in terms of change? 
It's a big question, right? Lots it of, is, it is a, a big question. About. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. think one of the one of the answers there is the getting back to what we talked about a little bit earlier is just the technology piece of it. I think just the you know the advancing technology um, and that being part of our part of our toolbox um, and part of what we need to know and what we need to deal with. Um, is just going to keep rapidly changing. The whole idea, I don't know about everybody in the, on the phone, but when the internet came up and uh, the guys in Silicon Valley um, started to develop online tools and internet and strategies, I thought this was going to be a really fantastic thing um, for society. And it's not that it's not a good thing, but it's not the fantastic thing we all thought it was going to be exactly. Um, it has goods and bads, right? Ups and downs. It's not, um, there's some powerful things about technology and the internet and there's some things that are, are kind of scary um, and that we need, to, we need to keep tabs on um, and understand. And I think, I just think that's going to be, continue to be a big thing. Um, the use of technology, smart cities, um, uh, security, all of those things are just going to um, continue to evolve and it's going to be, it's going to be hard to keep up um, with the latest thing. I don't know, Patrick, Tony. There, there, well, well, there, I, I think there, there is, and you, you, you do have to pay attention to and, and, and plan for and, and as best you can, the, the changes in technology, like, for example, ride hailing is cutting parking demand already especially in places where you can save money. And that's only going to accelerate as self-driving vehicles arrive. Um, the, so there, there is that and you, you have to be aware of it. Um, but on the other hand, it, don't ever forget that we remain basically the same creatures we were in the Bronze Age. Um, we, you know, we, we remain people who experience the world as humans who walk at three miles an hour and and you know are bipedal creatures and and it, the experience of going out your door and into your city is is still a person walking on a sidewalk um so learning a lot of the fundamentals of good urban design and making human scale places i think is an eternal um uh skill um things like learning how to draw by hand to be able to draw what you see and and um, communicate by sketching, that's eternal. Um, I mean, all of the all of the computer programming languages I learned are are obsolete and useless. That 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 stuff isn't helpful anymore. But being able to draw and write those are those are pretty eternal. Um, I will say one thing that is very real now that was more of the hey, we might have to worry about this someday, or actually we're worried about this, how it will affect our kids is climate change. You know, when I was, when I was a student, I was a research assistant looking at how an energy tax would affect um, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now this is clearly very real and, and it's gonna be, you know, like one planning job is to figure out where to put all the people evacuating. From all the fires, right? So, so um, I, I think there's the optimistic side of we have all this great new technology to help, and then there's the crisis side of well, we better get it to work as soon as we can because we need all the help we can get. That actually is one of the questions. If I jump down a couple, is what's the greatest challenges for future planners? Um, and it might be the climate change question. So everything that kind of trumps everything in terms of resilience and sustainability. Um, there's another question here from, let's see, Wesley Wong. Uh, what advice and recommendations would you give to students going through the early parts of their planning careers? Want to take a stab at it, Tony? Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think it goes back to that first thing I was talking about where um, if you have if you have a even a, a little bit of an idea about what you like to do in this profession, let's say you're you're really um, you're interested in transportation planning um, or something related to transportation. 
you know, seek that out. And if you can't get a job right away, um, you know, go around in those circles and learn, learn about what they're saying, what they're talking about, what, what is in, what are in the conversations. Um, if there isn't an internship available, what I did, I went to an architect's office and said, I'm going to go hang out there and listen to them and see what they talk about. And, and maybe I'll start learning. And eventually I did and started joining conversations. Uh, so there's, there's that part. I really, I really emphasize that. Um, I don't know what you call it. Uh, grassroots is wrong, but you know, like take it on yourself to just jump in and try and learn as much as you can, whether that you get paid or not, because once you start learning, you have some, something to share and a skill to offer. And once and as Patrick was saying earlier, once you have skills to offer or experience to offer, now you can start getting ideas about getting a permanent job. Um, to get a permanent job out day one was, is very difficult and I, I feel for all of you, but the best way to start equipping yourself to do that is to hang around the places or people that you think are going to be doing the things that you want to be doing. And that might change 10 years later in your career, but um, don't wait to be equipped, equip yourself. Yeah. Yeah. One, one thing that, that I've certainly recognized is that early in your career is a time to try to get broad exposure to a lot of things. Um, unless, well, I think, I think even if you think that you are really certain about the narrow technical specialty where you want to become the world's expert, um, it, there's a good chance, first of all, that you're wrong about what that narrow field is. Um, and even if, and even if you're right, um, early on in your career, you, you can often jump in and help out with a bunch of different things. Um, and, and in, in my first job at Stanford, I was able to do everything from detailed economic and budget analysis and um, parking management day to day of like, you know, literally going out and marking with spray paint where signs needed to go in, talking to homeowners about where we were going to set up a residential parking permit district, um, learning how to do basic transit planning and, you know, figure out figure out how to improve our shuttle system. I was able to do all of those things. Um, and you should look for those opportunities too. Um, it, it's really valuable as a planner, especially later on in your career, that you have a, at least a solid generalist understanding of a lot of different aspects. I mean, for example, um, when, you, when you end up managing a team of eight people, often they have better technical expertise in different areas, um, but you're the one who needs to, to help mentor them. And, and also you need to be able to present competently on any of these things to an audience. A um, uh, couple, other, couple other things are... Um, Patrick, can to... I just jump in on that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, just hanging on to that, that you know, that's what I was talking about early on about presenting and communicating, you know, you're going to need to develop the skill uh, of synthesizing something and, and, and B, uh, knowing the difference of when to give the long answer and when to give the elevator pitch answer and everything in between. That is something I've learned the hard way. Like somebody asks me a question, yeah. and like, oh, cool. I can give them a 15 minute answer of what I really <laughs> want to talk about. And they were really interested in just like a one sentence response. So, so understanding and, and, you know, you just don't know, unless you can read people really, really well, you gain that through experience, but being able to say things succinctly and then be being able to understand like, whoa, this person is asking me a part of the question that I don't understand. And I better just say, you know what, <laughs> let me get back to you or let me go get Patrick who really knows that or, or, or get Lisa. <laughs> You know, know when to say you don't know. I, I really want to encourage you. Yeah. And don't 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 take that on. And go. I, I don't know. No. You know, just say, hey, you know what? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I know who does, and I'll get back to you, or they will. There's nothing wrong with that. The worst part is to to make them seem like you didn't know the answer, and you tr and then you faked it. You wouldn't be you, you wouldn't be trying to fake it, but it would, could come across that way. 
And sometimes we, we respond that way because we don't want to appear weak or uh, we want to be competitive. And uh, it, you know, just push that down and just say, hey, I don't know, but, uh, but Lisa does. So. Yeah. I would say too, and um, this is coming from Wesley Wong, who I actually know pretty well and is doing a lot of the right things. Um, but I would say too, um, I mean, be bold. Don't be afraid to call people, follow up, email. I mean, the worst that will happen is they won't reply back. I mean, they're not going to be, they're not going to be mean. But I think you know, in, you know, uh, info interviews and stuff like that. If somebody comes to a class and talks, send them an email, follow up. When I was at Cal Poly, Loretta Lynch came. She was head of OPR at the time, and after she spoke, I went up and talked to her, and then I got her contact information, and then I got an internship at OPR. Um, and a contact, you know, a lifelong contact. So you just never know, you know, who that person might be that um, might have an opportunity for you or some information or another connection. Um, we do info uh, interviews all the time at the office. People call and they just want to understand stuff and figure stuff out. And if I don't have time to do it, we usually make, yep, you know, um, organize it with somebody else at the office. Um, but I would just say that, you know, don't be afraid to contact people, follow up, um, um, do that kind of stuff. I also think, um, you might know what you want to do, but if you don't just, just try a bunch of stuff and figure it out and then you'll, you'll figure it out over time. Um, Patrick started out in something else. Uh, Tony went into architecture, thought he wanted to go on to architecture and then did something else. I was an accountant for 10 years. Um, finally saw the light, woke up and was like, what am I doing? <laughs> changed my life. I was like, what, if I could do it over, like, what would you do? And I probably started planning earlier. Um, but, you know, recognizing that you can do something for a while and then change and then, um, and, and figure it out. And I think, I think, uh, with things moving fast and kind of the, what's going on, uh, in the world with all these different things, it's going to be part of your career anyway. You might think you want to go into transportation or affordable housing, but one thing leads you to another, um, and pretty hard to predict where you're going to be in 25 years. I predict everybody's going to be in a pretty good place, but nobody has a crystal ball like what exactly that looks like. You know, Lisa, you re you remind me of all the discussions that the the new had, um, you know, 30 years ago about needing more generalists and less specialists. And it's true, like Patrick was saying earlier too, that uh, it's it's what the what we all need. In the, in the planning profession is people who know more about a lot of things and aren't just this one specialist that when that specialty isn't being talked about, they're useless. That that you need to be, yeah. you know, maybe you're shallow in a lot of things, but you have a broader understanding. You're way more useful that way than being the mega expert on X. And if X isn't in the discussion, you're out. So. Yeah. A mile wide and an inch deep, right? Yeah. So. The next question is um, difficult concept to explain. Why is the most positive environmental project given a negative declaration? Did you guys see this? <laughs> I don't know. Good question. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I, I think that, that Ronald Reagan has to take the blame for that one because he's the guy who signed the California Environmental Quality Act into law in 1970. So we, we have to ask his ghost. Yeah. Um, just on a sidebar, people, you know, are love and hate CEQA in California, but when you go to another state that doesn't have CEQA, you find it kindly feel like you're like, there's a big problem because there's no, there's no environmental checks. Um, uh, and you're like, what do you mean we can't, you know, <laughs> protect the air or, you know, worry about stormwater runoff or, you know, that plant or animal, um, there's nothing to go to. So um, next question is, it's a long one. I think maybe we might have answered part of this. Um, planners have long been viewed as technical experts, but recently there has been much needed emphasis placed on treating community members as the technical experts of their own communities and centering their lived experiences within planning processes. Have you navigated this within your career and what advice do you have uh, for young planners who want to serve communities with respect and dignity and should, and without simply telling communities what they should do. I think it's a more of an outreach uh, question of 
um, working more closely with communities and not just come in as as the expert top down and sharing stuff. Well, it's a it's a really good question, and and actually, I I advise starting that that thought process by thinking about who is the community and and um, not just accepting that it's whoever shows up at the meeting that got called the same old way, um, because for example you can go to many historically whites only communities in this town or in any many california cities um and who's there well it's the people who you know inherited their house from their parents who got to buy in when only white people were allowed in or it's the people who can afford a um house in the community that has a median home value of three million dollars um, if you simply show up at meetings that the city planner has called and talk to those people, um, you're often excluding all the people who work in that town but can't afford to live there. Um, you can get really different answers oftentimes by changing um, the frame of who is the community and, and also by changing the way you do outreach. Um, so for example, one thing that we're debating a lot in California right now and trying to get right is what's the right balance between having state laws that tell everybody that they have to do their fair share versus having local um, jurisdiction and, and power. Um, so one of the big debates right now is, hey, should we be like Oregon and say, look, every community has to allow lower cost housing types. You can't simply say our town only allows single family houses, which tend to be the most expensive type, right? So that's one thing to think about. And then another is to think about um, how are we gonna do outreach? Because the reality is that oftentimes you only get to work on the local scale. Um, and so for example, in, in a recent plan for Davis, um, our outreach folks with the, the support of the city staff did a lot of outreach to people in places where they work um, and in places where they shop. And that gets you a very different uh, group of people. Oftentimes it's people who have less money and are more diverse than if you simply say, well, it's whoever is able to, to show up for a three hour meeting on a Tuesday night or worse yet, a three hour meeting in the middle of the workday. Um, so that's a, the, those are important things to, to consider. And I mean, what, another thing that I always try to remember is that, you know, I've been hired to offer my technical expertise and point of view, but nobody voted for me. And ultimately I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to get to vote, right? Um, it's, it's ultimately going to go down to what is the city council willing to vote for? So, that helps me approach things with a, a, a degree of humility. There's another aspect to the question um, I, I also I heard in there also about, um, you know, just the community becoming the experts. And I think that um, there, that's where, that's where um, a lot of planning efforts give up. Um, they, and you might not think they give up, but if you think of the professional team that is serving that project or and in a neighborhood or a community. And all they do is ask people, well, what do you want? Sure, the people that live there have the right and the position to, to say what they want and they're the ones that live with it. That's what goes without saying. What I'm talking about is that the people who have a professional understanding about all the possibilities or causes or symptoms or issues and, and, the, and they stay silent because they might otherwise influence the process. And there are so many planners that do that. It drives me insane because they're trying to do a good thing, but they're actually holding back a lot of information and knowledge in, in, in a good attempt to try and, and not influence the process. But in, in the process, the people that would otherwise be served by all that information are sitting there in, you know, not through any fault of their own, ignorant, of the possibilities 
or the possible solutions. So that's what I was saying early on in my first opening remarks about it's not wrong for you as a professional to have a position. What you do with that, that's different. But you know, why do you, you're, ha you're getting all this equipping and all this information and this, this understanding, don't waste it. Somebody, when you look a person in the eye, owner, a potential owner or investor, or, or a, a person that lives there, they're counting on your reaction, your, your feedback to make a decision about whether they uh, support something or not. And, and for the planner, uh, a lot of planners too often just say, nope, I'm not, I'm not taking a position on it because you know, it's going to become controversial. You just made it controversial. <laughs> you, you need to help people. And yeah, if you steer them and, and, and manipulate that, well then, you know, shame on you. But if you just answer the questions and say, hey, you know, there's this option and there's this one. And oh, by the way, they train me. And I also know about this other one, you know, that's what I'm talking about. Thanks, there's, you know, there's well, one last thing on that. Urban design is, is a secret weapon, as as one urban designer put it to me. Um, you know, a lot of times, um, neighbors are really good at identifying the problems and identifying goals, but oftentimes, urban design is the tool that they um, want help with, even if they may not. Or rather, it's the it's the tool that you can pull out. So, for example, I can remember being at a design shroud where a neighbor said, "Look, this house could could have a window looking directly into my window, um, and so what I really want is a ten foot setback or a twenty foot setback, not a five foot setback." And very quickly, that urban designer was able to sit down and sketch and go, "Well, look, um, actually." how about if we make it so that windows can't directly align with each other? And that way no one will be able to look at your window because actually the setback, you know, it, here, let me draw it out. And once they drew it out, he could see that, yeah, a setback wasn't really what he needed. Um, so there are lots of things like that um, where design can help you solve a lot of conflicts. So the next question, question is, um, how do you see the relationship between planners and developers slash financers evolving in the future? Are we coming together to fix problems? Or are we going, growing further apart? Um, I could take a stab at that and then throw it over to you guys. I think it's, um, you know, no, no one question has like one answer. <laughs> And no, no city is exactly the same. They all have their own personality. So I think in some places, people are coming together. In some places, people are growing apart. Um, um, in general, though, I think uh, planners are understanding that, you know, we need developers and financers to get things done more, than, more so than maybe in the past. And maybe there's uh, folks on the, on the call that would disagree with us uh, and been in the profession a long time. But, um, but I think what I've seen in the last 20 years is more focus on um, understanding the, really the market realities for developers uh, development. So when plans and zoning codes and development codes and mobility plans and strategic plans are done, um, they're more grounded in reality, uh, in market realities, instead of they need to be visionary, they're long-term. We can't just base everything on a five-year pro forma, um, which is what developers work from, but they also do need to be, you know, some level of feasibility. So I see this, I see this growing uh, more closely together um, in terms of implementation and people wanting to get housing built uh, and community amenities put in and community assets put in. Where I think we're growing apart a little bit is that um, because it's super expensive to run a city and to put all these amenities in, um, we're putting more and more exactions on projects and impact fees uh, for the parks and the roads and the, all of these things. And it's really, um, it's really making it difficult in some areas to get stuff done. So I think that's the, that's the challenging thing. We want beautiful cities with all these amenities, but it's expensive. Um, and sometimes the developers can carry that cost. And honestly, sometimes they can't. Um, so I think that's going to be an ongoing challenge, especially with all the budget issues, 
of how do we finance um, all of these improvements given shrinking budgets uh, and tighter financing um, and other sort of challenges. Yeah. So I don't know, Tony and Patrick, if you want to chime in on that one or. Well, some things, some things really are getting much easier. And, and actually now the challenge for planners in certain fields is um, to actually let the, the developers and the private sector get in and do good things. So for example, um, since Obama was inaugurated in 2008, the price of solar energy has dropped by more than 90%, and it's now cheaper than in, in many places and at many times than fossil fuels. And so the challenge for planners in, in energy, but also land use, is to, to accelerate that change. Um, and um, there, there's a lot of alignment between environmental sustainability and, and letting these guys go and, and make some money putting in solar panels and wind farms. Um, the, on the other hand, there are those eternal conflicts um, where the, you know, the developer um, wants to act as if you know, it's somebody else's fault that traffic congestion happens and his development shouldn't be regulated in any way that helps, that helps fix that. Um, so there, there's a certain level of um, conflict and we we really need to just be able to understand all right you know how much can be loaded on to um, this project before it collapses or how much you know with many regulations the question is how much is it going to be passed along to the person who buys that home right um, another thing i think is um, the tools we have as planners aren't fixing the fundamental rising inequalities in our society. Um, and that's something we have to solve in, in the rest of our lives as advocates and so on. Um, lastly, I'd, I'd say that um, it, it, it's really useful to learn a lot of negotiation and conflict resolution skills. Um, it, it, one of the best things I ever did was right after I started as a planner and began failing in meetings to convince anybody of my point of view was to go to the Stanford bookstore and buy a big stack of books on negotiation and conflict resolution. Um, and so those skills can really help you figure out what uh, developers actually need and how to meet their interests um, while still taking care of, of the community and, and serving the public. So we have a couple more questions and I'm not sure how much more time we have. I think while well, maybe we have like five or 10 more minutes, something like that. Um, the next question um, is um, uh, not an easy question maybe. It's can you all share any ideas or conversations you all might be having around centering racial justice within the field of planning, both in practice and in theory. So getting the conversation back to um, racial justice, which is now it's something obviously that's, that's huge um, with everything that's going on uh, and police reform and Black Lives Matter and all the stuff we know about. Um, I can start, if, I, if you guys, and then maybe you guys have other conversations you're having. So, um, I mean, this is a really good question. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's not the one I talked about earlier where we're all still learning about what we've been doing that has worked and what we're doing that's not working and how we, how we get better um, at this. But one of the things uh, that's come up for us right now, and actually I'm, I'm working with Tony on this is, um, we're doing some work in Columbus, Ohio, um, and they've had a few neighborhoods where there's been a lot of violence um, and racial issues, and they're having a lot of hard conversations with the police department and the mayor. And to kind of center, uh, we're just starting the project right now, but to kind of center or recenter the conversation, the project around racial justice, um, we actually were bringing in an expert in the community to help us uh, with the communication uh, and the material and knowing who we need to talk to um, and how we 
talk about technical topics that everybody might not understand. Um, so I think it starts in a, you know, we need to have a broader conversation about it and planning in general. Um, but as you are working through any particular tough project, thinking about this really hard and really early to make sure, um, you know, you can do all you can to reach um, underserved and minority groups. And I think that's one thing that um, we haven't always been good at, but I think we're getting better at it. And there's, we're not, it's not that we don't want to be good about it. I just don't think we've, it's, I don't know. My training was, we didn't talk about it that much 20 or 25 years ago, like we're talking about it now. Um, so just talking about it, I think is uh, um, opening the doors. And I think that everybody in the phone, um, you, we have the power to change this. So, I mean, that's the message, right? Is that we have the power. Um, we're planners, we're in, uh, we're in powerful positions. Um, we have a lot of knowledge. So I think we're, we should be right in the middle of the conversation. Um, and I think, I think we are, um, or we're trying to be, and we're trying to recenter that. So I don't know, Patrick, Tony. Yeah. It, it well, I should, I should say, you know, I'm a middle-aged white guy who grew up on the Stanford campus. So I, I, I was born as somebody who basically won the lottery. Um, the, I, it's an area where I need to do a lot of listening. Um, but one thing I will say is it's really been helpful to me to learn the history, um, to learn the history of my own town of, of Palo Alto. Uh, I somehow my memories of learning about the civil rights movement in in high school never mentioned Palo Alto. Um, I had no idea there were whites only neighborhoods in, in Palo Alto until I was long into my planning career. Right. Um, so to find out how the status quo came to be, um, you know, why is it that the 101 freeway runs through East Palo Alto, which was majority black when I was growing up and not through Palo Alto? Um, why is it that um, Geary Boulevard went ripping through the Fillmore and not through um, the Presidio or Pacific Heights? Th those are, uh, that, that's a San Francisco question. Um, if you look at a lot of these things, you discover, for example, that um, freeways got pushed through minority communities. Um, and so oftentimes, if you can help the, the communities who live there now take down that freeway and turn it into a boulevard, for example. That may be one of the best things that you can do as a transportation planner. Um, but, but just learning how things came to be. The, the book, The Color of Law by Richard Rostrian comes highly recommended. Um, and I'm, there's many other things. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is is reading and learning and understanding um, the systemic racism, particularly in our field, um, because we need to understand it and learn it and own that, unfortunately, um, to make it better. So I think that's that's kind of all on us. Um, there's, um, let's see, there's one more question, I think. There's comments here too, but I'm thinking, uh, there's one more question about immigration. Um, thousands of immigrants, immigrants and immigrants at the border are currently being displaced today. The number of migrants and immigrants increases every day. This continues to be an overlooked issue in urban planning. Um, where can they live with dignity? Can they raise their families in a healthy community free of discrimination and criminalization? Um, yeah, another, another tough, tough yeah. question. Um, I think, you know, I don't know. I think, I think one of the things California is trying to do, and we're trying to do it at our practice in particular, um, is just work on the housing issue in general. Um, we need more housing, right, across the board. The governor's working on three and a half million new units, uh, um, pushing that out uh, into all the regions. Uh, um, the SCAG region, I think, has 1.3 million units to plan for uh, in all income categories. So I think that that production of housing will help. 
Um, but what I, I don't know is getting a little bit off topic, but I'm, I'm worried about the, the push from the state on housing production is going to create a little bit of a backlash that we're all going to have to deal with because um, people are going to be uncomfortable with that amount of housing uh, and that intensity in their neighborhoods. And it's going to be something we're going to have to have to work through. There's all these bills that keep coming up for um, pushing more housing, more density by transit, uh, more density by transit corridors. There was one bill just recently um, to allow subdivisions of single family homes, SB 1120, um, that just recently failed. So I think this is something we all need to get more educated on uh, is this legislation that's out there. Um, <laughs> I get, we got a thumbs up from Jay. Um, <laughs> Um, and what it means and, the, and the, the, um, the positive side and the challenge that it's going to be because again it gets back to people being afraid uh, having all their net worth in their home and that being a really sacred thing uh, but we have all these other problems to fix yeah. so how are we gonna how are we gonna bring all that together um, not an easy uh, easy thing to solve but I think um, you know with the, the 65 people on the phone if we keep talking uh and learning and figuring this out i mean this is what it's gonna this is what it's gonna take yeah. there, there's also i have to say that it's really easy as a planner to get um sort of sucked into to talking about everything as a problem um and it it, it part of our jobs i think as as planners is to bring people out of that place of fear and darkness and over to hope and and over to seeing the benefits uh, it, it it's often true that you go to places where there are really smart people and oftentimes they have more degrees than i do and sometimes they have no degree and they're just smarter um, but they often don't have the knowledge that we are able to spend our days gathering and so it's it's remarkable. We were working in Cupertino and people were afraid that allowing more apartments to, for example, serve some of the workers who are, you know, provide homes for some of the workers who are there would overcrowd their schools. Then we talked to the planning uh, director at the school district and she said, oh no, our problem is that enrollment has been dropping. But these people are talking about a problem that we had 30 years ago. Um, I mean, the, the population of Dana Point, California, which is a beautiful beach town, it's fallen by 10% in the last 10 years. Um, it, you know, adding a few more uh, pedestrians to their sidewalks and apartments to their town. I, I, I think they, that actually many people, once they got over the initial change would say, hey, you know, it's, a, it's a, actually a little more lively and interesting around here. Um, and another thing is, America has a great tradition of building compact, walkable, mixed-use neighborhoods. Um, and oftentimes the only way that people can figure out that, that something is an apartment building and not a nice big house is that you go up and count the mailboxes and maybe the front doors on the, on the porch. Um, learning the urban design skills that were used to build those, um, learning, learning how to build a really beautiful fourplex and then actually how to write regulations that ensure that you get at least a pretty darn good fourplex and not some awful garage fronted thing um, is one of the key skills for helping people see that, oh, actually, you know, we've got room for a lot more people here. Um, the, the, I, I can remember one time Dan Parolik from Opticos Design was, was working in um, the, little, the little neighborhood right next to UC Santa Barbara. I can't think of its name right now. Um, right on the ocean, but um, people there were saying, oh, we don't want more than X units per acre. And he took them on a walk around the neighborhood and said, well, how about that apartment building? And they said, that's an apartment building? And he said, yeah. And, and he, he said, how about that one? And they said, well, that one's fine. You know, it was like two stories um, and, and uh, great old 20s building. And he said, well, let's go count the mailboxes. It turned out it was a 80 units per acre, um, but they just had no idea and they, they couldn't picture it. So to be able to use the skills of urban design, form-based codes, things like that, um, to welcome more neighbors, including neighbors from other countries, it is actually really helpful. Great. 
Well, Juan, I think we've gotten through all of our all of our questions. Maybe I'll turn it turn it back over to you. But I want to thank everybody for all the great questions. It's super impressive, um, keeping us on our toes and keeping it real. So that's that's good. Thanks, Juan. Uh, thank thank you, everyone. Wrap. For the great questions indeed. Um, and thank you, Lisa, Patrick, and Tony, uh, for your thoughtful advice and for sharing your experiences and lessons learned. You know, it, it, it's truly invaluable. If, if I myself had known then what you shared today, I think all of us would be better off. Um, you know, one of the things that I do want to announce is while you were sharing, I received a text message on my phone from a California planner who'd like to remain anonymous that has pledged a match for our scholarship goal. Um, dollar for dollar, uh, that planner will match um, up to $20,000. So we actually have an opportunity now to double our goal um, and maybe reach 40,000 by the end of the year. So again, I wanna encourage um, everyone um, not necessarily our scholarship recipients, um, but everyone else, and we'll continue to promote it at the conference as well, to go online to the California Planning uh, Foundation's uh, donations page um, and to donate generously, because now every dollar you donate will be matched. So thank you um, uh, to our anonymous donor for, for texting me. Um, I do want to congratulate again all of our 2020 scholarship uh, recipients, our CPS scholarship recipients. Um, you know, it's, it's um, you all who are our future planners, um, our planning colleagues, our future planning leaders in the profession and in the APA organization. And uh, we're just so uh, thankful uh, and passionate about being able to uh, provide these scholarships to our future leaders. Um, I want to thank um, all of our presenters tonight, Julia, Hing, Hillary, Merle, Lisa, Patrick, and Tony again. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, have a great night and have a great rest of your conference. Thank you.